Right, here we go. Yo, yo, yo. What up, though, man? Got a Detroit gatekeeper in the building. You know, record executive, put on tours, move across the nation. A Detroit pioneer and trailblazer, man, dog face. Welcome to Mogul State of Mind. What's up? I, How you feel, bro? Hey, man, you know, I'm, I'm blessed, bro. I appreciate you coming to sit down with me, man. Oh, pleasure is mine. Now, I got a chance to see your interview on uh, Off the Porch. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, how, how do you feel about the media space and what it's doing in music right now where you have a lot of independent media outlets now? I mean, so it's necessary. Uh, if you're in the music business or if you're in any business, advertising, marketing, it's a cornerstone to expanding your brand, introducing yourself to people who don't know you. I always tell artists that I deal with or just anybody who I deal with, whether it's music or outside of music, uh, uh, if you, if, the way, that, how do people know who you are yeah. if not through advertising, marketing, and promotion, all right? They, they, they'll they never know whether they like what you have to offer or not until they know that you exist. Yeah. They know that you exist through using marketing, advertising, and promotion. So it's necessary. All the different various forms of media. I'm glad that you have some of... I'm glad you don't got to go to world star hip-hop. I'm glad you can... Because they get jaded. They only deal with people who have... You know, status or stature. Yeah. They don't give a fuck about the little person. You hear me? So the fact that you have all these different media outlets and blogs and all that, nah, that's positive. It can only help. Do, do you feel like right now, some people are debating, are blogs more important now than DJs are? Yes. Because they have a wider audience. A, a DJ, you're playing to your audience. Mm -hmm. Your audience is in the room you in. Yeah. Blogs are worldwide. There's no limitations. It's kind of like internet radio versus regular terrestrial radio yeah. and that radio stations and satellite radio stations are, are a bigger space in which to advertise, to communicate because they communicate to the world yeah. versus being restricted to how far your antenna can reach you 20, 30 miles. For sure. Yeah. So take me to the beginning, man. Um, Detroit native. Um, what, what part of Detroit you grew up in, man? And again, what's that upbringing like? Well, I was born in Pontiac, Michigan. Okay. I moved to Detroit when I was 15 in 1987. I moved to the east side of Detroit. So, uh, Van Dyke Harper area. And then I migrated to the East Warren area. East Warren, Van Dyke, between Van Dyke and uh, Connors area. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I came to Detroit. I was selling dope. That's when I first came to Detroit. I came to Detroit to sell dope. My cousin was already down here in the Van Dyke mm -hmm. Harper area. It was already... You know, they were already moving around down there. So when I came down there to get some money, that's why I came originally. And then you said that was what year? 1987. 87. So that's a year, that's like best friend time. That's Have it right in the middle of everything. You know what I'm saying? Maserati Ray. Everything. Know? Yeah, I know them all. all right, did you, was best friends as notorious as people make it to be? Worse. Did, worse. Yeah, my god brother, uh, he in the Fed joint right now doing a 15 piece. Uh, he, came up, he he's an honorary member, mm -hmm. right? So when I came down here, I was running around with them. So we was like the younger version of the Friends. We called ourselves East Side Team. So we was running around, uh, basically blessed in by the people who kind of like were moving and shaking in the Friends. Damn. Yeah, so in terms of Notorious, yeah, because it was just about, it wasn't just about selling dope, it was about you make it, we take it type shit. Yeah. You hear me? Was, you know was was best friends more consumed with bodies than actually making money for dope? Because it seemed like they was just so bloody. And so most people want to not have to get bodies. Want to just make your money stay out the way. Like catching bodies start making you more notice. Well, see, like during that time, bro. So it was under, it's understood that if you were in the streets, if you, if you dropping bodies, you're going to bring heat on yourself. Mm -hmm. That's going to interfere with you actually making some money. Yeah. You feel me? But, uh, so it wasn't just about selling dope. It was about, you know, it, you know, it, it's different parts of the game. People don't want to acknowledge, no one accept. Like, robbery is a part of the game. Yeah. Laying the motherfucker out, that's part of the game. You know what I'm saying? Playing on the motherfucking walking nigga, that's all part of the game. People want, they only want to glamorize the dr selling drugs and then buying shit with your drug money. And they only want to acknowledge that. That's all part of the game. Niggas breaking down and snitching, that's all part of the game. Yeah. Motherfuckers try to put honor in the streets when really, there really ain't no honor in that shit. When you look at like 
when you watch all the movies that niggas watch, niggas watch uh, Scarface and all the gangster movies, right? You watch the mafia movies and the Lucky Luciano, all that kind of shit. They had police in their bike pocket. When you think about the Bumpy Johnson shit, right? Bumpy Johnson, a real person. Madam St. Clair, real person that was battling against the uh, Irish and the Italian mobsters in the New York on the East Coast. Yeah. They was calling the police on them. <clears throat> they was calling the police trying to shut down what they had going on in Harlem versus it wasn't it, it was it was war too, but when they couldn't get to them with the pistols in the war, they set they stuck the police on the nigga. Yeah. So the mobsters always had police and and always utilized police and 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 and, and prosecutors trying to get rid of their enemies, bro. That's some shit that motherfuckers don't want to acknowledge. Motherfuckers use the police. Like right now, the biggest the biggest drug dealers in the history of the city of Detroit had police on their team. And when they couldn't get at a motherfucker, they used the police to lock a nigga up. They dropped dimes on niggas to lock a nigga up. That's all part of that shit. You know what I'm saying? That's all part of it. I'm not saying that, that part is right, yeah. but it's always been that, bro. And it's always going to be that. Because if a nigga can't get you <clears throat> or if a nigga afraid of you, right? then a nigga gonna use whatever means he can use to get rid of you. So niggas always been trying to use the police to get rid of niggas. That's what they do. It, when you jumped in the game, at this point, it's crack. That's what's booming. Crack. And heroin, yeah. And heroin. Yeah. And so at that time, do people who use crack use both? Or do they pick one or the other? No, you, that's kind of a hybrid dope fiend, bro. Nigga, I know some motherfuckers who use both. Super dope fiend. They have a drug of choice. You yeah. have motherfuckers who fuck with heroin. Crack can't do shit for a nigga who fuck with heroin. They go, heroin is the, you, that's the highest level of addiction you can get, you hear me? So what happened? So, okay, so your mom loses the house, then what happens after that? Shit, we was forced to go to the hood, because we wasn't staying in the hood first, mm -hmm. you hear me? We was forced to go into the hood. We had we forced into an apartment, we went to a one room, not one bedroom, a one room apartment. Man, efficiency. Me? Yeah, first time I ever seen some roaches and shit, you hear me? Damn. You know what I'm saying? Roaches running around doing doing what they do. I, I, I saw some I saw a post that said they was arguing that children who are raised by single mothers tend to do far less than do far worse than children who are raised by single fathers, regardless if it's male or female. Mm -hmm. How, what do you think about that? I agree with it because, well, you mean in terms of raising black boys? Raising children, period. It is just saying. You know, fathers are traditionally more of a disciplinarian. They assume more of a, tr tr a tr disciplinarian role in the family dyna dynamic. Uh, so, you know, women, they're more emotional and they operate off emotion. Not saying that they're weak, but yeah. they tend to look at life through the lens of more emotionalism. So that happens. Uh, I don't know that black women don't do a good job raising black children solo. Uh, I think that the, the you know, I, I mean, black women have had the responsibility to raise, of raising black children, you know, as the black family structure breaks down, you know, black men typically let their children be raised by the woman. They go off and do what they do. You feel what I'm saying? Uh, black women, they do what they do. There's a criticism about black women raising black boys absent a father. Yeah. That's hurtful because black <clears throat> men learn through, all children learn through watching what you do more so than they do by just listening to what you say. Yeah. Right? So there's, there's a component that needs to happen in terms of rearing and training and teaching black men. You learn what to do by watching your father. If you don't have a father or a strong uh, role, male role model there, then you're going to miss out on some of the shit you're supposed to do. You're going to miss out on that manhood training. I don't know that single fathers do a better job than single mothers. Black fathers, I don't know that that's true. Uh, I can imagine because black men operate differently than black women. Yeah. yeah. It, I, I brought that up. I mean, because we see it like a lot of the men who are incarcerated usually was raised by their mothers. By mothers. And it's, it's not necessarily about mothers doing a bad job it's just trying to figure out why is the dynamic of being raised by a loving, nurturing, responsible mom and why it doesn't always correlate to a functional adult for male and female. Well, because the, the, the reason why is because that's not the way God intended it to be. Hmm. God didn't intend for you to go out 
fuck, make babies, and then have no father. God didn't intend for you to go out, fuck, make babies, and then leave the woman with the baby. That's not the way it was intended. So you have the dynamic is thrown off because that's not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, you no, know, when you produce a child, there's supposed to be a mother and a father there in the orbit of that child, that child being raised. You're gonna get certain, you're gonna get your empathy and sympathy and your, you know, you're gonna get your more of a, a, a empathetic view on life yeah. dealing with your mama. But then you have the contrast, you got your father there going out, making it happen, being a leader, being productive, being strong. You know what I'm saying? Opening up the door, protecting your family, protecting the whole household. So it's a dual component that's supposed to be injected into that child's mind, whether you're a black boy or a black girl. Yeah. You, know, you wasn't designed. God didn't design us to be running around being single mothers and seeing single parents. Yeah. That's why. Got you. Yeah. So here In it my is. opinion. No, I mean, and that, that's fair. You know I, mean? that's, I that's love to hear somebody argue against that. You hear me? I mean, I... I feel it. Like, I mean, I guess I look at it like, I don't know. I, I think you you had a fair assessment on it. Yeah, but it's to tough. ask your question, to be to specific to specifically ask your question, bro, black women, you know, they've been forced into a position where they had to raise their kids on their own mm -hmm. because the father is absent in the most part. We all know that the single parent household in, in the urban community is it is what it is. What, what so about they're doing the best they can do? Yeah. What about when they say women are incentivized though? Not to have fathers around. Like, that, you that, can get I'm housing. 50. Right. I'm 50, so that was true. The government put people who were on welfare and on government assistance, they put the women in a situation to where it's more to your advantage if you don't have a man. Because when I was coming up, if you was on ADC, it's FIA now, yeah. if you was on ADC, uh, you couldn't have the man in the household. Yeah. Or you weren't gonna be able to get your rent vendor, you weren't gonna get them food stamps, you weren't gonna it ain't like it is now where you can have the whole family can be on assistance. Okay. Back then, it's the woman and the kids. It was if you was a man in the household, so if the if your worker used to come to your house, like now they don't come to your house now. Back then when I was coming up, worker used to come to your house. If she see a man in the household living, if she see any signs that a man is living there, you getting your shit cut off. So, nigga, if you ain't finna pay these bills. You ain't finna help out and take the lead. It's, you can come hit this pussy, <laughs> and, but you got to go. You, you can't sleep in this bitch because in the morning, my worker might come. So in that way, the government did incentivize yeah. black women. Like, if you ain't going to come handle your business, bro, you can't come stay here. So you don't have the presence is not there. You got to get the fuck on. Yeah. So they pushed the man out the household, but they didn't push productive men out. They produced... They pushed lazy, non-productive niggas who wasn't about taking care of their family. Get your ass on. What about, because like, don't it also, like, if the woman do file for A, it automatically got to put the father nah, on child support? That ain't the way it used to be. The way it used to be, you ain't had to say who the daddy was. Yeah. Now, because the government want to be refunded. They want to, yeah. because they criminalized child support, especially under the Bill Clinton administration. Yeah. When Bill Clinton... And then you had Joe Biden, bitch ass, when, <laughs> when he was Senator Joe Biden. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That crime, the crack crime bill versus cocaine. And then the welfare reform bill. Motherfuckers in love with Bill Clinton. Motherfuckers championed Joe Biden. But the, the Democrats and under the Bill Clinton and under the, the guidance of then Senator Joe Biden, they did more in terms of making laws that hurt black people and minorities than the Republicans ever did in this country. Got you. And so here it is. Now you're in Detroit. Um, your your circumstances financially change. Who who introduced you to the game here? As far as getting into the streets, uh, the cats I was with. You know what I'm saying. I came down here specifically with my god brother. They were already moving and shaking down here. Oh, so when your mom moved, when you and your mom moved to that apartment, y'all moved somewhere else just in Pontiac? Yeah, in Pontiac. Oh, okay, got yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, And then you, so what made you eventually leave Pontiac to come here? Opportunity, bigger city, more money. At 15, you're by yourself though, at 15. So how you yeah. had that conversation? 15, with? At 15, I was 30, bro. Psychologically, I was already out there. I was already terrorized in Pontiac. I'd already been locked up. I'd already... Been to the training school once. I ended up going to training school a couple different times. But I was already out there. Pontiac wasn't big enough for me, bro. Yeah. I was already terrorizing, and robbing, and everything moving. Damn. <laughs> I was already making the idiot with the gambling joints. I'm sticking your ass up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm fucking you. I'm fucking you over. I was a stick up kid. You hear me? How old were you when you did your first stick up? 12. Can you take me through that, that experience? 
Oh shit, little white boy, little white boy had a little bike I wanted. You hear me? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> my, my mama was on drugs. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? So that's what really kind of like pushed me out there. Gotcha. I had to survive. I had to eat. I didn't do it because I wanted to do it. I didn't get in the street because I wanted to. You know what I'm saying? My mama, I didn't have a father. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I didn't have any contact with him after the divorce. Yeah. My mama with the drugs. When I, when I was 12, she started using drugs. So it was, it was on me. I had to eat. You know what I'm saying? So I had to eat. I had to find out, figure out. I had to figure it out. You hear me? So that's what led me into getting into the streets. Gotcha. Jumping off the porch. Yeah. It was not having nothing, bro. I had to do what I had to do. Gotcha. So you get out here in Detroit. You start hustling. What was the experience like hustling in Detroit during them days? And if you could kind of compare it to like what you think people may be going through now, hustling, like were those days better? Was it more money? Was it more flow? Well, yeah. uh, the difference between Pontiac and Detroit was the level of violence, mm. like the immediate level of violence. Like in Pontiac, you can debate, argue back then, it ain't like that now, but back then, everybody didn't have no pistols, bro. You know what I'm saying? So it could be a fight and that's be that's what it was. Yeah. You hear me? You can have a, a altercation with a motherfucker and that's what it was, you hear me? Coming to Detroit, ain't no motherfucker arguing. That's the first thing that I arguing with a motherfucker will get your head knocked off. Debating and going back and forth with a motherfucker, even if it ain't that, once that argument jump off, it can be that immediately. So I, I learned that immediately that that's what it was. You feel me? Yeah. Uh, in terms of the difference between the then and the now, you had a longer run. You had a longer run because they they they, they didn't know how to deal with crack. They didn't know how to deal with the crack epidemic. They didn't know how to deal with, uh, you no, know, the police didn't know the ins and outs of the dope game at that particular point in time. There was still a lot of shit that they did not know about how you to operate and how drug crews operate. Now, niggas and told on everything, so the police know everything you know. Back then, the reporters, Bill Bonds, knew more about drugs and crack houses yeah. than the fucking police did. The police didn't have a clue for how to stop it or how the inner workings of this shit operated. So new. You know what I'm saying? So you can have a longer run. You know what I'm saying? You, they can walk right past you. You got, a, you got pistol and dope all on you. They don't have a clue. You know what I'm saying? It, it, the signs and sim symptoms and the signs and symbols, the symbolic shit that yeah. we now know is common with a drug dealer, the stereotypes uh, in, in terms of pointing out who could possibly be a drug dealer, it wasn't like that back then. You had a longer run back then, you hear me? Because they ain't no shit. They was like the Keystone cops running around trying to catch a nigga doing some shit, bumping in the heads, you hear me? We knew the raid was coming. We shut the house down. Let the raid happen, and then when they leave, open that bitch back up. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean? it just it was what it was. You know I mean? Now, as an adult, did you ever go to prison? Fuck yeah! yeah. I, I, I mean, what's the longest? What's the biz you did? Oh, well, I ain't no loser, bro. I went to prison one time. Well, okay, <laughs> right? Once. I ain't no get out, go back, get out, go back. <laughs> they ain't no. I went to prison. I did fifteen years, nine months, and twenty nine days straight. Shit. Straight. I went to prison at twenty one. Well, count my county jail time. I did seventeen years. Okay. I went to prison at twenty one. I came home at 38. But what was so what you go down for? Drug trafficking, robbery, extortion, money laundering. I had state and fed case. Mm. So uh, it was a, it was an indictment. It was a 56 count indictment with 11 additional supplemental charges. So you know, we was, we was, I was in the crew. So the whole crew got knocked. Got you. And my whole crew got knocked. So you being in prison that long, like 15 years, man. Like, what did you feel like was the the hardest thing you had to go through there? While you was in there? So just being separated from just society as a whole, bro. When I was in the street, I kind of like, before I went to prison, I got my life together. I got married. I was in college. So it, I wasn't like the typical kid who just come from a situation like that. And then I, I always knew that selling dope and being in the street ain't what I wanted. It wasn't without, I knew that that shit wasn't, wasn't no future in that shit. Yeah. And I never aspired to be a drug dealer. You know what I'm saying? My god brother was the kind of motherfucker where he was born to sell dope. He was born to make raw. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We know that he was, you know what I'm saying? But me, I never aspired to be that shit, bro. I knew because I come from Oakland County. Pontiac is Oakland County. So Pontiac is surrounded by affluence. Like Pontiac yeah. is the hood, but we surrounded by Bloomfield, yeah. Waterford, Rochester, Novi. So I was able to see affluence. And I was able to see quality of life contrasted to where I come from in the yak and then moving to the city. 
So I sold dope to improve my life. I didn't sell dope just to be, hey, look at me, look at me. I used the money and the resources to improve my life. So when I got locked up, I was in college when I got locked up. I was in my second year at OU, Oakland University, when I got locked up. Oh, man. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I could have, if I would have, when the indictment came down, when they started looking for motherfuckers, they didn't even know where I lived at. A cat who was in our crew told on me, and that's how they knew where I lived. I was off the radar, bro. I was married, you know what I'm saying, doing my own thing. I was living in a screwed lifestyle. They only got me because if I would have knew what happened, if I, they only got me because a nigga who's in our crew told Damn. where I lived at because they didn't have a clue where I lived at. So you you go into a prison, you're there 15 years. Uh, do your wife, do y'all get a divorce? Uh, she divorced me when I was in county jail. In county jail. Yeah. Man. Yeah, she did. She divorced me when I was in county jail, baby. Yeah, but she was out. Yeah. Do, do you think women, what percentage of women you think hold their men down when they go do a bid? I think that percentage is influenced by how much time. Mm. The quality of kind of guy he was. Because I know, I know situations where, uh, I know niggas who weren't really about much and their girl rode with them 10, 15 years. And I know niggas who was out there killing them, getting them a bunch of money who as soon as they got locked up, shit bust up on them. And that's because niggas really like a, an abusive dragon ass nigga to begin with. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So getting locked up for some chicks is they happy a nigga gone because he was a fuck nigga <laughs> to begin with. Or he was out, a outrageous type nigga to begin with. I know some niggas who weren't really about nothing. Stole the car and baby mama, wife, whatever, rolled with him the entire time. So it's based on the kind of person a motherfucker is, you hear me? So what made you think, why would you think your wife didn't stick by you? Why she gave up so quick? My wife, I was on, I was, I only, I really don't know. I think she was disappointed because I had promised her that I wasn't going to get locked up. Yeah. And I don't know, if you were in the street, I don't know how you could really promise a motherfucker that. You know what I'm saying? But I had promised her I wasn't going to get locked up and I got locked up. And uh, I think it was, a, it was a couple of more factors uh, that went into it, man, but you know, it was what it was, what it was, bro. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't even know why. Gotcha. You know, I think she was disappointed. You know what I'm saying? So that's what it was. I got married when I was 19. Okay. And she was 31. Damn. When I got married. So I don't really know. I ain't. I, we've talked about this. I've been home. Uh, and she 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 told me that she felt like that. I left her out here and abandoned her. But she divorced me right away, so it was what it was. It, it was it a call on the phone, like, hey, you know, Hell no, I'm the papers in the mail. I was a kind of jail. That paper in the mail, I was in the mail. I was I, I, when I got like that, I was getting two of the deputies. Mm -hmm. So I was in the hole. You know what I'm saying? They slid. They, I wasn't even getting my mail. That's some shit. They was keeping my motherfucking mail, but they gave me a divorce paperwork. Man. I think it was some psychological shit. They didn't even open your mail, look at this shit. It was legal mail. I got the it was open though. It wasn't even supposed to be open. I guess they seen what it was and slid it to me like, yeah, nigga, on some psychological torture type shit. Yeah, no, that's, that's crazy. Like, I know, I know for a lot of guys, they when they go in, they say they just try to block this world. Depending on their time, they just try to block this world up. You can't block this shit up, bro. Anybody told you that is a liar. Unless you're just doing two, three years, it don't even matter. You ain't finna miss shit. If you got a big bit to do, like when I went to prison, I was never coming home. You know what I'm saying? I ended up giving my time back, and, and that's how I was able to come home. I would never come home when I went to prison. So, you know, you know, you can't block this. If you, okay, I'll tell you what. If you if you lived any quality of life, if you had anything, if you was having, if you was having shit, when you get locked up, you be sick. Cause you you know what you're missing. You know what you're missing out on. That worldly shit, some bad shit, bro. Yeah. The worldly shit is that's what make a nigga tell. Cause they too caught up in the world. They can't see being removed from that shit. They can't see being removed from the getting high, getting drunk, fucking the bitches, hitting the club, shopping. That's what inspire a weak nigga to break down because they so caught up in that kind of shit. You mm -hmm. hear me? But if you have emotion, bro, you seeing life, you traveling, you living life, you be sick when you get locked up. Any nigga who ain't sick, if it don't matter to you, oh, you was a bum, nigga. You was a bum. <laughs> it's an upgrade. Bro, you get locked up and you ain't sick. <laughs> nigga, you was a bum. You ain't you ain't leave. You had nothing to leave. Yeah. Find me one nigga who got locked up who ain't sick. Who like, I don't matter, I'm just gonna block this shit out. Nigga, you got kids. Especially if you have children, bro. And you was having, if you have it, you get locked up, you sick. I don't give a fuck who you is. Yeah. You don't think Big Mitch was sick? Hell yeah. 
He wasn't used to being told what to do. It ain't just about missing out and not having a car or a chain. It's about you being told what to do by white trash, bro. You being told what to do by hillbilly motherfuckers who, you, nigga, if it wasn't for this job, you would have shit, bro. You being told what to do by a nigga who making twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars a year. Nigga, I'm making thirty, forty thousand dollars in a week. Yeah. So you being ruled and governed by motherfuckers who you don't respect. You feel me? Now, I'm assuming you part of NOI or FOI? NOI. NOI. Michigan NOI. Islam. Yeah. Um, One of the guys from Mr. Farrakhan. Yeah. Did you become part of um, NOI in prison? Or did you find I that joined. I was, I, I was a Muslim before I went okay. to prison. I took my Shahada in 1989. I was 16. Okay. Uh, when I came, when I went to prison, I was a reader even before I went to prison. And getting in the county jail, when I, when I wasn't trying to fuck over me, forget the tour with him, I was a reader. Uh, the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, as represented by uh, the Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan, they 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 were more closely they it more closely resembled and fitted what I what I thought about life in general. Yeah. When I started to study, you know, I agreed wholeheartedly with the teachings. So that's why I gravitated towards Nation of Islam versus being a Sunni or a Shiite. Got you. Okay. So you you come out doing the fifteen year bid. Mm -hmm. What was the biggest thing you had to adjust to the real world after doing 15 years? Bro, the biggest thing I had to adjust to was just getting comfortable with being free. Uh, I had family, resources. Uh, uh, so it was just like, I was well read in prison. I used to read everything from popular science to popular mechanic. I used to read all the tech, computer tech. Yeah. So I was kind of like, I didn't have the act, no actual hands-on experience. Yeah. But in my mind, you know what I'm saying? Being in the nation of Islam, you can't be in prison sitting back not knowing shit, just being unaware of shit. You, part of your duty and responsibility as a black man is to try to educate yourself as much as you possibly can about the world. Yeah. So I tried to keep myself uh, in tune as much as I possibly could with what was happening. I had people who were sending me pictures uh, the casinos and all the other kind of shit that had went up in the city of Detroit because I 15 years, a lot of shit changed. Yeah, for sure. Right, so I tried to stay, people were keeping me up on the world as much as they possibly could. So I came home, I think the biggest adjustment was just being free. You know what I'm saying? Being free was a motherfucker. Like when I first came home, my parole agent was like, uh, you got to be in the house by 11 o'clock, blah, blah. And I, nigga, I was in the house by 10.50, I'm in that bitch. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was spooked. You know what I'm saying? I was spooked. I hadn't got, you know what I'm saying? My man like, you ain't be in the house. They don't know. As long as your name don't get on the hot sheet, they ain't coming to your crib. You yeah. free. They don't give a fuck what you do. As long as you don't put your name with the police contact and be on the hot shit, they don't give a fuck what you do. I'm like, nigga, I'll be out and at 1050, I'll bring out into a sweat. <laughs> Take right. me home. I don't get, nah, uh Take me back to the crib. I can't afford this shit. You hear me? So adjusting was just simply just being free, bro. Absorbing shit, looking at shit. I was quiet. I wasn't, I wasn't, I'm all, I'm in my personal experience outside the dog face shit. I don't be doing as much of talking. I observe, look, listen. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's what it was. Just absorbing and taking things in. How did you end up getting into the music game? At what point did you get into it? And 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 by what means? Artists, management? No, my first jump to I was I was rapping. Okay. What happened was it was a guy. I ain't gonna say his name because he a bitch ass nigga, right? But it was a motherfucker who was my young dog when I was in prison. Uh, he was rapping when we was in prison. In prison, I wasn't rapping. I was even though I was in Nation Islam, I was running around stabbing niggas, fucking niggas up. Oh shit! <laughs> I was getting suspended. I was getting oh, kicked shit. out the Nation Islam. Shout out to my man Marvin Cotton. He exonerated. Just came home and was doing twenty years in prison. He was exonerated. Uh, uh, I helped bring him into the Nation Islam. So when I, when I was teaching and training him, I was like, the law is the law, bro. If a motherfucker violate the law. He got to get dealt. He got to get disciplined. He got to get roped up to whatever. You hear me? So I think I was gambling, robbing niggas. You know what I'm saying? I was yeah. robbing niggas, gambling, selling dope. I call it dope case in prison. Oh, shit. <laughs> I call it dope case in prison. You know what I'm saying? Doing all the shit I wasn't supposed to do as a member of the Nation Islam, but I had to survive. I had to eat. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I don't even know, bro. It just. Uh, so you know, with the rapping. The, so, all the rabbit shit. Yeah. The rabbit shit. I, 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 I seen, my daughter had an opportunity to go to Cash Tech. Okay. So they had like an open house. So I went to Cash Tech with my daughter and he was there with his son. Coincidence, I hadn't seen him. I had been home maybe a year. He had been home four or five years before I got home. So I seen him. So he was rapping in prison. 
So we're like, man, you know, I'm doing what I said I was going to do. You know, because the big thing about guys being in prison, coming home and doing what they say you're going to do. Yeah. So I'm going to be a rapper when I came home. So he was like, man, I want you to come to the studio and just hear some of my music, even Joy Road. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So I went to the studio about a week later. I heard, he, I think he had four, five songs done. Uh, and uh, I, I heard the shit. You know what I'm saying? It was all right. But you know, he was hollering about some Joy Road shit. I'm an East Side <laughs> nigga. You know what I'm saying? I've been on the East Side since I was 15. Yeah. I don't listen to no motherfucker. I, I come from a generation where it's a difference between East, East Side and West, West Side, side niggas. Here, yeah. I'm from that cloth. I ain't, I'm, nigga, we, I looked at West Side. I didn't know. I thought all West Side niggas was hoes until I met some West Side niggas who wasn't. <laughs> right? Because right? I, when you come to Detroit, I'm around all East Side niggas. Like, them niggas some hoe ass, silver spoon ass niggas. Niggas go to church <laughs> type shit, right? Them niggas ain't fucking with us. We some gorillas type shit, right? And it wasn't until there was some West Side niggas in our crew who was some dangerous men. And that's when I realized, oh, these niggas ain't all hoes. Some of these niggas make them all, they worse than us. I had to actually live it in order to understand what it was, right? So, uh, no, so he was hollering Joy Roll all day. I said, that shit's straight, bro. But you hollering about Joy Roll. I'm an East Side nigga. I ain't listening to no motherfucking Joy Roll <laughs> shit all day. I ain't finna listen to no nigga hollering about no X9 all day. I'm not finna sit back and listen to that dumb ass groupy shit all day. You know what I'm saying? So he was like, man, in prison, I was like a shit talking, ignorant motherfucker. Yeah. You no, know, I was like the most shit talking his ass, arguing this nigga in the world in prison, right? So I'm the kind of nigga, I make fun of the nigga. You don't get no mail? I'm like, nigga, you ain't get no mail, nigga? Why, that, why they just speed past your cell and drop no mail off, nigga? And you just said you just came from the street, you was getting some money. How you ain't get no stove when you just left the street? You ain't, how you get money? You ain't been gone a year. How you yeah. broke already? So I used to talk about niggas and cap on niggas in prison. So he's like, man, why don't you rap with me? Right? I said, nah, I ain't no motherfucking rapper, bro. I don't know about no motherfucking rapping. So we're like, bro, you could do it. You the most shit talking motherfucker in the world. You ain't, you ain't got a, he ain't got a rhyme. Yeah. At that point in time, he pointed out baby from Cash Money. He's like, you could do, don't be rhyming. He just be talking this shit. He said, you could do it, bro. I know you could do it. So I think he had four songs done. The project, I ain't even gonna mention the project. Uh, the project that we, we finished, the finished project, it was like twenty one songs. I was on the next seventeen songs. Damn. And the most popular songs from that project, I was on. And I was just talking shit. I wasn't even trying to ram. I was just talking my shit. I had tapped into my shit talking shit. So and you was already was. calling yourself Dogface at that time? Yeah, like, I did, yeah I, Dogface came from prison. Dogface is a prison term. It's like, yeah. Dogface means you ugly, but you my nigga. <laughs> right? You ugly, but you a cool nigga. My man, uh, Butler Bay, gotcha. gave me, my man, L.A. Tricky. Matter of fact, it was my man, L.A. Tricky. My man, Trey Wheat uh, from L.A., Crip nigga. I was real cool. I was in the penitentiary from L.A., uh, he started calling me dog face. So dog face is like a term of endearment. It's like, you my nigga, but you ugly as a motherfucker, but you my nigga, nigga, I'll fuck with you. Got you. I, I stab niggas with you. You my nigga, you a solid nigga. Got you. Know, but you ugly though, but you my nigga type shit. Got you. So that's where it came from. So so with the the when did you, it involve to get into the executive side of music? And what's what's the connection from Detroit to Tampa? Kind of break that that down. Well shit, Tampa came later, bro. Uh this was like 2010, 11. Okay. I came home in 2009. I got in the music game in 2010. Uh, I was behind the scenes. I was immediately looking for a way to make some money, bro. And I realized that it was a lot of things that I didn't know about the music business that I was never going to make no money. So I wouldn't like no young nigga just rapping, just be rapping. I'm already old, nigga. I'm already in there 40. So I was immediately looking for ways to make money. So I started to do research. I was reading the r and publication. I was reading the Source Vibe. I was watching, you know, YouTube had started to come up. We started to watch the shit. I was watching shit. And I had a few friends, a few people who I was who I was associated with who kind of like was giving me the game about how to set your publishing up and how to really get into the money making side of the music business. So I was like, it's like a disconnect between me. I'm 40. I'm talking about gators and suits. These yeah. niggas talked about not that. So I was like, I'm too old for this shit. So I immediately stopped rapping and went behind the scenes and got into management, marketing, development, uh, arts development, uh, marketing, advertising, promotion, marketing development. You know what I'm saying? So that's how I got into it. You hear me? So from that point, I switched to that and I didn't rap again for 10 years. I just started rapping again. Okay. Uh, about a year, year and a half ago. And that's because now I have more influence and I have more connections than I ever had when I was 
rapping 10, 15, well, well, 10, 12 years ago. Yeah. So I just did it because I could. I just like talking shit. Who were some of the artists that you got behind when you got into the management side? Well, I have worked with a lot of different artists. Uh, one of the things that I did, I coined the phrase ghost management, right? Okay. And so I started doing promo tours where I would take artists from the city of Detroit and we would do concerts in uh, St. Louis, Memphis, Alabama, and Atlanta. This is back in 2012, 13, 14. I had a tour called a Mob Life uh, Music Tour yes. where I would take artists from Detroit, the Metropolitan Detroit, Detroit, Pontiac, Ann Arbor, Ipsy, Lansing, Flint, Saginaw. I would take them all to, and do a show in Memphis. I would take them all and do a show in Atlanta or uh, Tuscaloosa, Birmingham, Alabama, uh, St. Louis. So I started doing that, and that's when I started to see a lot of this shit about you know how the music business out actually worked. I didn't really learn about how the music business worked in Detroit. I didn't learn about how things were supposed to work until I started to travel with the music shit. Yes. Like I would rent a venue in, in Memphis. I would be on, on Main Street right off Bill, a place called 300. I would rent a motherfucker out and we would throw a concert. I would tap in with somebody. Every, all the cities I went to, I had either family or people who I was associated with in those cities who was in the music business. So I would just tap in with them. We'd put a local show together. They had some of the top unsigned artists from those cities come together. And I would have, it'd be like Detroit versus Memphis, yes, Detroit man. versus Birmingham, Alabama, Detroit versus St. Louis, Detroit versus Atlanta. So that's how people in those cities, were, they came out because it was like, oh, these niggas from Detroit trying to come here and sun us. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that's how it went. And so that's when I started to learn about how the music business was supposed to work. And then I bumped into Al Nuke. Okay. I bumped into him. And he gave me a lot of game about how the music business, because he was at that point, my my tapped in with him, he was managing Zaytoven. Okay. So he was right there in the forefront with, you know, everything with Gucci coming back home with the Jeezy shit. So he was moving and shaking with the who's who because Zaytoven, you know, legendary producer. And at that point in time, Zay was the hottest motherfucker in the world. So I learned shit. You no, know, he put me to the side and gave me a bunch of free game. You know what I'm saying? He's from the East Side of Detroit too. And, you know, we connected on some East Side shit. So he gave me a bunch of free game about how it worked. And I used to, I went down there, you know what I'm saying? And I kind of like was rotating with him as him and Zay was moving around. So I had the opportunity to meet Gucci. I had the opportunity to meet fucking Thug and all them niggas. I had the opportunity to meet everybody who hot now from Atlanta. I met them just being around Al and Zay. So he gave me a bunch of game about how shit was supposed to work. So that's when my wheels started turning. So I took that game and brought it back here. So I, I coined the phrase called ghost management. See, I was controversial, bro. When I first came home and got in the music business, I'm going to clubs, beat niggas ass. You know what I'm saying? Because niggas was using like, like well, who, who the fuck is this nigga? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Where he come from? You know what I'm saying? They ain't know me. So when we rapping and I'm doing my thing, you had a bunch of niggas who had a bunch of shit to say on Facebook. Like, who the fuck is that? Who he, he think he tough? That was some tough shit. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so they're like, who the fuck this nigga think he is? So we had a bunch of motherfuckers in the city of Detroit. That's the open mic era. Club status, yeah. blondies, club scene. You know what I'm saying? They was a bunch of motherfuckers didn't like me in Pacific. One, I'm a East Side nigga. Two, I'm a shit talking motherfucker. And it just wasn't what it was. So at that point, you know what I'm saying? Niggas was talking shit about me. So I was the kind of motherfucker like, if you say something about me, I'm fin I'm, I'm gonna come find you. I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come fuck you up. Period. And nigga, if 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 you call me, if 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 like for example, if if you say Odolph is a whole ass nigga on Facebook and he like it. I'm seeing that shit. So when <laughs> I see him, I'm gonna cut to him about him liking. I'm gonna, I'm gonna find you. We gonna get. We gonna have an issue. Yeah. However, shake it, shake. I'm pulling up with the chopper, right? And then when I see him, cause he liked it. So nigga, like this nigga, this nigga, he, nigga, like you can't, you can't. I, I ain't even read it. I yeah. confront nigga, nigga. Say, I, I, I just liked it. No nigga, you got to be. I told niggas, I swear to God, with an interview with Floss Lot and TNB Films. And this was 2000. 12. Nigga, you got to be careful about the kind of shit you like. Nigga's going to start getting killed about the social media shit because niggas reckless with that shit. Social media give a nigga a voice don't really have no voice yeah. to attack a motherfucker, which is what niggas do. Niggas misuse social media. So if you call me a hoe and he like it, like, oh, nigga, I got a problem with you. When I see him, 
I, I'm gonna show him the like nigga you did you what what he's like oh I, I ain't even read it as much as that kind of shit. Gotcha. So it wouldn't take me long to become a bad guy, bro. So everybody did. man, the whole city of Detroit went against me, bro. You know what I'm saying? I was up with club status. That's when Mike B, who owned Sloppy Crabs, on club status on eight mile okay. at that point. I got into a couple of incidents up there. You know what I'm saying? I had to slap some motherfucker down up there. I got into an incident with a female. A female spit on me. Oh, shit. Sure. Spit on me. I slapped that bitch to the ground. So when I did that, motherfucker, like the whole city, like, oh, he's a woman beater. He beat women. Yeah, I hit that bitch. Yeah, you know why? I hit that bitch because, bitch, first of all, bitch, you don't be spitting on no man, bitch. You hit me. I'm, I, I didn't even look at her like she was the woman at that point. I'm slapping you down, bitch, to the ground. That's what's going to happen. Because in my philosophy is, as a woman, there's a way for you to express your dislike or displeasure with something a man does yeah. without you actually stepping into the shoes of a man. Nowadays, a bitch will walk up to you, bitch ass nigga, you a hoe, suck my dick. You have, what, bitch? You say what, bitch? Oh, bitch, I'm beating your ass, bitch. I'm, I'm gonna be the, I'll be the bitch ass. I ain't afraid to say it. Bitch, you call me a bitch to my face. You walk up on me like you a man. You present yourself to me like you a man. I'm slapping you down, bitch. Cause you wrong, bitch. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I had a, I had a moment. <laughs> yeah, it's I roll out and sweat and everything about this here shit. You hear me? But so I coined a phrase called ghost management. Like motherfuckers want to walk, work with me because they see me traveling. I mean, the Tampa Bay shit came later. Tampa yeah. Bay came in 2016, 17. Uh, but I opened up the hip hop gateway between the underground with Detroit and Memphis. Detroit and St. Louis, because I had motherfuckers doing features from Detroit with niggas from Memphis, St. Louis, or Alabama, and niggas wouldn't even know that kind of shit. Yeah. Niggas didn't understand the value of spreading around, moving around, trying to establish a greater fan base by doing promo runs and promo tours. Niggas wasn't doing that shit. You can't find a motherfucker in the world who was moving around doing promo tours, who unsigned motherfuckers doing promo tours. Yeah. Because if a nigga wasn't getting booked and wasn't getting paid, they wasn't going. So how, how much, if you were on a scale of one to 10, how influential, 10 being the most influence of you creating your, your system of moving artists out the city, how much, one in 10, how much influence do you feel like what you did contribute to the success? I showed of motherfuckers to move around. Niggas weren't moving. Fat motherfuckers moving. Pick a name. Let's go back. I started, I started the Mob Life Music Tour. I started moving around, networking, not just with promoters and doing shows in other states. I started tapping in with the program directors, assistant program directors, mix show coordinators, and radio stations from Alabama, St. Louis, Atlanta. Niggas weren't doing that shit. Philly, mm. Baltimore. Niggas weren't doing that kind of shit, bro. Niggas was just trying to build their star here. They weren't moving around. They, niggas weren't going nowhere except that they was getting paid to go there. They weren't moving around. They weren't connecting with. Right now, right now, I could snap my motherfucking fingers and take a motherfucker. I could take, I could take her song and put it on the radio tomorrow mm. in six, seven different states tomorrow. I can put it on the mix so motherfuckers can hear it. Nowhere yeah. near here. Not no Ohio, not no Kentucky, the shit that we, our playground. Yeah. I'm talking about from coast to coast, I can make it happen. Niggas wasn't doing that shit. Niggas say it was doing it was lying. It's lying. So when you saw, when the gate, Detroit Gatekeeper list dropped and you saw you was number 13 on the list, how did you feel about it? I wasn't mad about it because I ain't, I ain't know, if you don't know me, and just if you judge me according to just social media, to Instagram or whatever, bro, it looks like that I care about a lot of this shit with the clothes and the jewelry, just me me talking shit. I don't get. I, I was happy to be on it. I was honored to be on it because it was to me it was just, it was an acknowledgement of all my hard work. Any motherfucker who in the music business, if they say they don't want to be acknowledged at some point, lying. Yeah. Whether you're in, if, 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 if whether you're in front of the camera or behind it, whether you're in front of the microphone or behind the microphone, it's nice to be acknowledged and recognized as a motherfucker who can make shit happen, yeah. right? And if you're a behind the scenes person, you your power base increase once people understand that you can move the ball from point A to point Z. Yeah, why would they come to you? Why do they want to come? Why do they, why I have hundreds of motherfuckers from across the country in my DM. Want requesting to work with me in some capacity, either direct management or help me help me helping them executive produce a project, or me helping them reach a hell of a, yeah. or helping a, reaching a jit fire in Tampa, or a JP on the track in Memphis. You know what I'm saying? I'm a networker. I'm a mover. You know what I'm saying? So if people don't know that you're able to do that, 
who gonna come to you and ask for your help? And see, that, that was the whole goal of the list is to yeah. introduce the people who you I probably wouldn't know was in your backyard. Hey, that listen, was it. My nigga, when, I, when that list dropped, I heard about it. Somebody said, man, you on the list. You know what I'm saying? I went, look. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the niggas was on that list, and it was like it wasn't no. It was it was, it was ordered because it was like one through whatever yeah. it was. But I was just like, man, I've been grinding hard, bro. I'll be lying to you. Every motherfucker on that list was happy about it. Oh, uh, all that old nonchalant shit about uh, I ain't give a fuck lying. They lying, <laughs> bro. If they probably wasn't on that man, list. I just said they lying. <laughs> they lying. Every nigga on that list was happy. They may have been happy about the position. I wasn't tripping, bro. Because to be mentioned in the same conversation with people who I respect and people who I know can make shit happen, to be mentioned with them yeah. was a beautiful fucking thing. I was happy as a motherfucker. I'm like, my nigga, let me send it. I, I got I'm, I gotta send you a care pack. I'm gonna get before I leave here, I'm gonna send you, I'm gonna send you a cash app before I walk out this bitch, you're getting a cash app. God damn it. Hey man, I appreciate it, bro. What's up? My tight college teammate, you good. But no, nah, man, I I'm glad, man, because like I said, Texas, that when I dropped that Texas gatekeeper list, that was the first list of that guy. Because usually all the lists is artists, right. producers. But to put like the shaking and moves behind Listen, the scene. That your, your list, your list didn't just have an impact here in the city. It created a major impact in the city. Niggas was arguing. Niggas ready to pull up on a nigga about that list. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> a nigga who wasn't on it, they was, boy, boy them niggas was, I would laugh. They was smoking. If you were in the music business behind the scenes and you went on that list, yeah. you 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 really your list had a financial impact on niggas because people, up and coming artists or people who were in the music business who had budgets and were willing to spend money to cultivate artists or to to get a, a contact with the connection, yeah. they went immediately to the people on that list. If you ain't on the list, and then your word means something. Yeah. So it wasn't just the list, it's who put the list out? Niggas didn't attack you. One nigga with the ass whoop. Number two, I'm legit. I've been grinding for 20 years plus of this shit. How you gonna debate it? And then when you look at it, everybody on the list, it, it's a reason behind it. Yeah. You can't take away from nobody who was on that list. It was a well thought out, well diagrammed list of motherfuckers who really moving and shaking. That's what it was. That's real. A motherfucker say that they wasn't, that they was, they, nigga, on that list, I went to sleep like a baby that night. You hear me? I told you, bitches. <laughs> bitch, I plugged in, bitch. And if he said it, bitch, you never need to know what it is, bitch. And a nigga went on that list. They were salty. They, they didn't, couldn't get it hard for two weeks. <laughs> you hear me? Yeah, motherfucker laugh. If you say you ain't want to make that goddamn list. The next time you do it, nigga, niggas want to see it, want to be it. And nigga say, hey, you want to be in this? A motherfucker laugh. They mama laugh. Yeah. They mama motherfucker laugh. Because I was switching my kids. Look. <laughs> you see this? So all the, all the hard work is being acknowledged. Yeah. Right? It was nice to be acknowledged, bro. Anybody say they, they, that it's not nice to be acknowledged for the work that you put in, the sacrifice that you've went, they lying. So like right now, with everything that you do and got going on, like what are you offering to artists right now? Like where is your focus in the game right now? Oh, I, I mean, just uh, my company, they call me the promo guy in the city. Detroit. Yeah. Ain't nobody who can... Uh, ain't nobody, when it comes to taking an artist and developing them, right? I coined the phrase ghost management, like I mentioned earlier. That's because it, 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 I have calmed down now versus me, even when I met, I was, when I met Danny, I was off the fucking hook. You know what I'm saying? She's <laughs> like, oh, this nigga Danny. nuts. We was at Hazel Place, this nigga, I think, I think, uh -huh. did I fuck somebody up at Hazel Place? Did yeah, I beat somebody? I, um, yeah, you did. I, um, at the DJ booth. Right, but right. The second time I saw him, he put me on blast, but in a good way. Like it was I'm Zay cool Tobin. like that. It was Zay Tubman, the producer, Al New. It was a building full of people and artists, and I walk in. We was downtown? Yeah. We was downtown. I walk in by myself. He uh. go on the mic. I didn't even know he remember my name. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. He grilling this mother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody else flocked to me that night. The whole night, all the celebrities, Zaytoven, all the was like, who is this girl? Yeah, so me, <laughs> I, 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 they call me the promo guy, bro. When it comes to taking the motherfucker and taking the motherfucker who nobody knows and turning them to a household name, can't nobody fuck with me, bro. Yeah. There are motherfuckers who are, who do what they do. You've interviewed some of the motherfuckers, you know what I'm saying? They, they some, 
They 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 are they they top notch. But when it comes to the making it happen, I'm talking about without no help, yeah. no assistance. There ain't no feature from this nigga who already going. I'm talking about a nigga who nobody knows, with not no help, no feature. Can nobody fuck with me? Period. Simple as that. Not mm-hmm. now. Not when you put that list out. But really not now. Can't fuck with me. So if I drop the list right now, where you should be? <laughs> I'll be in top five. Top five. Top five. I can name them motherfuckers who should be ahead of me. I can name them. I'm, I'm humble like that. Yeah. I'm top five. Why not top eight? What? Top eight. Listen, my nigga. Oh, I took hell of a... <coughs> when it comes to the success that Detroit is experiencing right now, Yeah. right? My nigga, I, we, we in hell of a has been... We, I took hell of a to cities... Niggas didn't even know who Peasy, they didn't know who Babyface Ray, they didn't know who Solid Baby was. Me and me and Hell have been to cities championing Detroit sound. Mm. You go to Tampa Bay now, there's a kinship between Tampa Bay, Florida, the 813 and the 313. And that's because I helped usher that sound. I helped usher the sound between Detroit and Memphis. It wasn't Doug getting signed to CMG. It was me in 2013, 14, spreading Detroit and hooking niggas up and putting niggas together. At Birmingham, Alabama. That was me who made that happen and brought the cities together. Yeah. Did a lot of groundwork, period. Nobody can't, they can't fuck with me, man. And I'm saying that in the most humble, sincere way possible, period. So I, I, I want to end with I'm this. I'm top five, period. Top five. Period. So if an artist want to get in contact with you, in, in, I respond in, to social media. They can so, social DM. media, is it a certain type of budget they need to have together? You gotta have a budget. No finance, no romance. <laughs> ain't, gonna, ain't, gonna be no, ain't gonna be no romance. And I and I have, so listen, in the last five or six years, I've invested over $200,000 in artists who I no longer work with. You mm-hmm. hear me? Believing in motherfuckers who didn't even necessarily believe in themselves. Uh, Believing in motherfuckers and putting my money behind my money. And then a lot of times motherfuckers look at shit when it's just like money. But like my contacts and my resources are valuable as well. You know what I'm saying? My 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 resources and my contacts are more valuable than money at certain times. Cause I've already cultivated relationships. So motherfuckers, they tend to discount or overlook me making a phone call yeah. or me sending an email or me reaching out to somebody on their behalf. There's a dollar value that has to be attached to me doing it. Because you can't do it. You just had Neek in here. Everybody can't call Neek. Everybody can't call a Snell Dominique. Everybody can't call a Zaytoven. Everybody can't call a hell of a. So I've done shit for motherfuckers, bro. Put my money behind R&B artists and hip-hop artists who I don't even work with niggas no more. Without a contract. Mm. Without a contract. I want to show a motherfucker what I could do before I locked them into a contract thinking that me showing you the loyalty with my effort, my energy, my money, that would... Be reciprocated. You, you, you ain't getting that from nowhere. Fuck no, they ain't reciprocating that shit, bro. So now, if you want to work with me, right, you got to have a budget. Period. Simple as that. You got to have a budget or you got to have somebody who got a budget for you. I ain't fucking with you. <laughs> point, I don't point give a fuck if you rap like Jay-Z, Tupac, and, and motherfucking. You got to have some money, bro. You hear me? Period. Simple as that. I ain't fucking with you. You know what I'm saying? You have to have a budget so I can use. And it ain't for me. You know what I'm saying? It is so I can do everything that I have to do for you to turn you into what what you were destined in some cases to be. Yeah, I'm straight. You know, I've I got you know I'm good, but I ain't. I'll get my money to my motherfucking kids. Yeah, I ain't, I, I ain't put no money behind no nigga. <laughs> in fact, I ain't, they ain't even have net on my mama. I ain't you hear me? Yeah, may God strike me down if I ever take another penny and put it behind a motherfucker. Now I do do shit for people, uh, like in Tampa Bay. DJ Shizzle, 95.7 to beat iHeartRadio Tampa Bay. He does a new music Friday thing down there. So I do take artists that I know from Detroit and I have their songs debuted on iHeartRadio Tampa Bay because I can. Yeah. It's the same thing with, uh, with uh, uh, St. Louis, Memphis, and Birmingham, Alabama because I'm cool with all the mix show DJs. right? So I do do that just as a way to continuously have an impact and effect on Detroit. You know what I'm saying? Because just because you're from a particular city, just because you're from Detroit, now, I mean, that's where you're going to get high at first, bro. You might have a sound that's more conducive, uh, more conducive or more playable uh, in Memphis or in St. Louis or in Dallas or in Baltimore. You know what I'm saying? Somewhere outside of here, bro. You, you know, just because you're from here, I mean, where you going to get high at first? You can get high somewhere else. You don't know it if you don't go. That's yeah. why moving around is important. Hey, man, when I tell you what, bro, 
I appreciate you pulling up on me last no. minute. You know what I'm saying? You could have been anywhere in the world, man, but you pulled well, up, man. Now. And I'm I appreciate it. out here tonight. Hey, man. <laughs> But well, we gotta tap in, bro. I love to come to Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? I plan to come to Atlanta in June. Yeah, I'm, I'm and I love to tap in. Uh, we can go golfing. Uh, I can go golfing. Okay, yeah, let's do it. We can go golfing. You golf? I'm not, but I'm trying to learn. Yes, That's been can, on my bucket list for this year. We can go. It's the easiest shit in the world to do, bro. There we yeah. go. Well, it ain't. I take that back. Golfing is really harder than. Oh yeah, than, I, than a lot of other sports that shit is physical. Yeah, but tap in. You come on there, fuck with me. Let's go grab some to eat. Spend a few last play a few rounds of golf. Let's make it happen. Hey, for sure. With dog face, man. Detroit gatekeeper, top five, man. I'll talk to you soon. Man, let's come out. Listen, whoever your brain trust is, I know it ain't just you. Yeah. Whoever you tell them to look at my body of work, my nigga. <laughs> you hear me? My body of work is second to none. Hustling? Yeah. Second to none. Call hell of a. Hell of a. Yeah. I'm a. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't talk about hip hop without talking about hell. There you go, facts. Call uh, hell of a is dogfish on my on my five top five list. Making shit happen. He already said on the Ultra Porch interview. Nigga, make shit happen. Facts. It is what it is. I appreciate the opportunity, man. Hey, man. For sure. Well, dogface, till we meet again. Yeah, till we meet again. Salute. Peace. No doubt.